happy place full of laughter. It was beautiful before. This, yeah, it's an amazing job. Amazing. But uh, as, as Peter says, this is what happens when you let a film crew into your house. So. I thought it might be quite good as if you guys take a beat here and, you know, some of you could just, you know, walk into here, looking around and, 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 and look into the doorways, look at, you know, kind of just, just, for, just for a beat, beat or two, you know. We shot a few sequences of the dwarves arriving at Dale, so it was like the first lot sort of walking through and, and seeing what had happened and the reveal of the dead inhabitants of Dale. And all around you'll see the charred bodies of actors who haven't quite made the grade on the film. A lot of influence and reference for Dale was, was Pompeii. So we had these bodies that had been burnt and frozen in time. And we really wanted to capture that feeling that people were mid-movement when they died. There was a foreground shot of one of these characters completely incinerated but cradling her child in the foreground and we sort of shot past that and onto Martin as he walked past and he saw them. It was just awful. You know, you'd see charred children's toys and, you know, evidence of what had been a bustling sort of lovely village life. And lovely. It looked like it had been blitzed. I mean, it looked awful. Dale was nice when it was beautiful. It, it looked very, very pretty. But I kind of preferred it when we trashed it, I have to say. That was the Dale I preferred, the creepy kind of speaking about. I think the set finishers and, well, everyone involved really has just done a fantastic job on this set. Even enormous sets, uh, like the set of Dale, which was a huge set as far as sets go, is actually a very tiny little section of Dale itself. We did have to create a digital Dale in which we could locate our, uh, our main kind of courtyard set in the Great Hall. One of the sort of starting points for us was that Alan Lee did this sort of map of Dale. Kind of starting off with our, our set right in the middle. He actually drew the roads and main kind of blocks of housing. And with that, we were able to then break that map down and figure out where action played within that map. We needed to very quickly build this entire area and so I sat down with Alan Lee and we took one week and we built all of Dale um, and the surrounding valley including this little bit of Ravenhill and, uh, and the whole Erebor Gate. If you look at this particular um, shot here, we're just going through and we're, we're finding specific areas within the, in the city that we can set things up. Now, some of these are based on the live action set, so we're using the, the live action set for the models and whatnot. And then we want to be able to see Erebor from here. We want to be able to see Ravenhill from this section. And from that, we, we go through and, and start, you know, figuring out, like, w where these live action plates are going to live within the set. So the layout model would be quite kind of simple, and then we would provide more detailed drawings, and each building would be individually modeled. We sort of built maybe, you know, 24, 25 hero buildings that you could sort of turn, kind of like what they would do again on set. If you turn it this way, the facade's slightly different, it's stained differently, so you can have a lot of reuse out of them, and you sort of use it to populate the whole city, so it seems quite a lot larger than it actually is. It was actually a very successful CG model. Um, it's one of the things I was most, most pleased with, really. But then Dale was quite an amazing experience. Remarkable set, where you can imagine yourself in a totally far-flung part of the world in a different time. I've never seen anything like it. And I've worked on good things, and I've worked on things with fantastic sets, and nothing has surpassed uh, what Dan and his whole army did, you know. And all the time they had to could put on the side of his script uh, NAR, no acting required, because there it was. We didn't have to act where we were. It was absolutely believable.
his eyes are opened, and the Thranduil that we see after that is a man who is re-engaging with the world. You're close in that mountain. White gems strung upon silver. I want it retrieved. It's also one of the focused on our characters and not let the battle just become a lot of hacking and slashing. I try to think of the battle as being just a location for our characters. We try to always keep our character stories alive and flowing through. So there's certain rules that we give ourselves, like when we're in a battle sequence, we try to not go for more than two or three shots before we cut back to one of our main characters. They're on the battlefield, but it's not just fighting, it is, you know, dramatic scenes. I think we always knew this film was going to be a, a war film. I will have war. And um, once you saw the rough cut, it, it was the Battle of the Five Armies. It's definitely, there can't be anything else. It just cannot be anything else. But the Battle of the Five Armies still had a long way to go to be created. and sit here like cowards. If you decide to do this, understand, you may not return. They just get rid of defense. They cast it aside so that they're light and they're able to move quickly and do what they need to do. And they're gonna... I remember filming the acorn scene very well. That was my last scene. That was my last day. Action. What is that? In your hand. That's fantastic, Martin. Now, if you could just pretend that you've got your little winky in your hand, uh, we could call it a wrap. It's like this is your line. Oh, I, I know who that is. It's, um, oh, it's the guy who plays Smell. What's his name? Um, Oh, he's fantastic. Hello. In the book, we moved it from Dale to a more personal place, which is on the battlefield, so that the two characters, and also that Bilbo could hold on to the notion that... The monitor and you feel really content. It looked like a painting. It was kind of spiritual, just so that he didn't have time. Bilbo! Oh, lie still. Don't, <clears throat> don't move. <sighs> I'm glad you're here. <laughs> when characters don't have time to say what they need to say, that creates great drama. You're not going anywhere. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? You are going to live. <clears throat> I take back <clears throat> my word and my deed at the gate. <clears throat> it was kind of the culmination of their very rocky for Hino, you know, figuratively and literally. The most difficult words for Thorin to say to Bilbo were when Thorin apologizes and says thank you to him. You did what I had to. True friend would do. I am so sorry that I've led you into such peril. I remember on the beginning. Uh, lie still, lie still. Uh, lie still. Don't move. Don't move. Uh, that fine, trembling sensitivity that the voice has in those very emotional moments would have been. We've shared in your perils, Thorin. Uh, each and every one of them. And it's far more than any Baggins deserves. That's the point that you know that you're going to end in good terms, and when he gives it to you, you... Before I die, I think that's really the peak of Thorin's journey. Fell. Not the back. Go back to your books. And your armchair. Plant your trees. Watch them grow. If more people value the home above gold, the world would be a merrier place. No, 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 Thorin. 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 Just one more moment. Just wait one more moment. If the eagles are here, Thorin, 
Sometimes some of the best written scenes don't have dialogue in, you know what I mean? And it's still, that's good writing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's economical writing. Mm. It was nice. It's nice. It's still a lot good. Mm. Suddenly, I... It's a moment when you see Thorin nearly come back from his madness, and it's because of the simplicity of something that Bilbo's done to just capture this little acorn in his pocket, because he's thinking about home. You've carried it all this way. I'm going to plant it in my garden, in Bag End. And so it's not for much longer. It really feels like this is the end. This is the end. Right. Yeah, at this stage of the battle, they think that all is lost. Get some bowmen up into those towers. There are no bowmen left. I let myself imagine this city restored. We would take what had been destroyed and rebuild it. We would wash away this sadness. And the streets would once again be filled with life. Full of hope. No, 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 no. Come now. Don't despair. What would you have us do? 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 Here. Here. I'll show you. Bilbo! There's a chance of new life. It may sound hopeless, it may sound foolish, but uh, really, what else can you do when faced with death? What can anyone do? <laughs> you go on living. Mm. Bilbo, I'm gonna get, I'm not gonna get home. So let's just plant this simple acorn here. In blood-soaked soil. And I have a memory, a sort of sense memory, I suppose, of there just being blood in that soil and putting the acorn in there and there was blood on my hands and blood on the earth. So there was something right about that, that I was planting this life and a beautiful thing in the midst of this horrible... Great performance. Well, if any of you are ever passing Bag End, uh, tea is at four. There'll be plenty of it. Always welcome. Don't you bother knocking. <laughs> well, tea, tea's at four. Uh, I can barely look at you, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. You know how I feel about you, and I'm not really able to say it. But I hope I see you again one day, all of you. So come by, don't bother knocking. I was kind of saying different things to them every take, just because I, I thought, well, I better make it fresh and interesting each time or something, otherwise it'll be really boring by take three and they'll really be having to squeeze out any tears, you know. Make sure I've still got my silverware when you come to Bag End, please. Don't you nicking off with any of it? <laughs> I used to be scared of you, Dwalin. You wouldn't believe it. Feel free to drop in and eat me out of house and home yet again. <laughs> That's not an instruction, Bomber. <laughs> he was so great, and he was just looking at us right in the eye. And yeah, that was that's a big scene. I think if you let a bit of real life in, I think it's quite. <laughs> I know Dean was asleep. 
That was a bit. It's, uh, uh, the it is relaxing until you feel like you're going to fall asleep, and then it's, you scare yourself. I'm just looking in utter contempt. Peter was playing this quite sad. It was really lovely. I remember. It's a beautiful piece of music, and it's got kind of a cadence to it that gets you into a kind of a rhythm, which is a rhythm of loss. According to legend... Wars were letting go of Thorin and acknowledging the new king under the mountain, which is Dane. And action. The king has come unto his own, under mountain, under stone. That stuff's pretty hard to beat when you're having a funeral eulogy to a much-loved figure spoken by Ian McKellen. It's, it's pretty hard to top that. <laughs> Send him now unto the deep, unto earth, eternal sleep, under mountain, under stone. Under mountain, under stone. I mean, that's what he's about sharing his thought and emotion with you. I mean, he does it with Shakespeare, and he does it, he does it with Tolkien. Through all the lands, let it be known. The king is dead. Is everybody shouting along to the king afterwards? Yeah, they should, they should, mate. Should, yeah, should, yeah, should. yeah, yeah, and, you should, and as you raise your weapons, you say, long live the king. Long live the king! Long live the king! I think we were saying long live the hobbit as much as we <laughs> in the big for the first time how immensely strong the dwarves are because they are moving boulders the size of foundation stones for buildings as if they are packing cases this work you know this is normal limestone almost like sandstone so they had a bit of weight to them i'd rather have a really heavy rock than than have to act a heavy rock <laughs> That's a heavy one, man. That's a real stone. Bring more stone to the gate! Richard, I actually wasn't managing to put them down on time, and I had to actually fend a few off, which was great for the scene, because it was just like, this guy is nuts. It was fun. Yeah, my goal was to knock him off his feet. I'm joking. Hey, no, it's just... Uh, yep. To actually rebuild that wall and chance to use our strength to say, right, this is our home, this is where we're staying. Come to tell you, and then he would start moving. We've come to tell you, payment of your debt to the man has been offered and accepted. <laughs> payment of your debt has been offered and accepted. We have come to tell you payment of your debt has been offered. And you can you set your watch by it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Move. Uh, you can go, especially when suddenly Thorin's talking to a horse's ass. Is he objecting to the dialogue? <laughs> Everybody's getting things ready and, something and yeah, trying right. to start. Peter said, I want you to work out how I found the particular piece of armor that I'm going to wear and how I picked the particular weapon. Action. Master Buggins, come here. It was principally that moment between Thorin and Bilbo where he gives him the mithril vest. And we had to do a lot of what I would call pantomiming in the background, which led to a lot of hilarity, of course, because in those sort of situations, actors divide into two groups. There are actors who take it very seriously, who give themselves a backstory. Why am I in the armory? Why am I picking up this spear? What am I thinking about the battle ahead? All of that is processed and then expressed in the deep background in the scene, having little petty arguments. I don't want that. Where did you get your armor from? Get off, stop f***ing my Jed Brophy. Looked like a bunch of turtles. Does the color really suits you? I think I got the best armor. I didn't go to the bathroom. Have you not been here? God, I think I'm gonna just have to go here in the armor. I don't think I'm gonna be able to make it. Yes, all of this went on. <laughs> A character who has an axe in his head and he had to find a helmet that he was going to bust a hole in. William Kirchner decided that he was going to be hammering a helmet in the back of shot. But it kind of faced. So we decided we'd have to get rid of the hammer. So we kind of stole the hammer. 
and we would hide it as a joke <laughs> to see if he could find it. I go to my place, it's not there. Which makes you look like a complete tit because you've got to running to grab something that isn't there and you've got to think, oh God, what am I going to do now? So he had to end up sort of hitting the helmet with his own hand. Aidan Turner was hiding my stuff. Aidan Turner. The set turned into school. It was just like being back at school. And there were people that you went to school with who were like William. And there were people you went to school with who were like Aidan. And uh, I leave you to decide <laughs> which one you fit in with. Now I begin to see. I am betrayed. Dragon sickness. I've seen it before. I wish I had been able to. T Stinginess. Refusing to let single point. Not one piece of it. I remember saying to Fran they should share a line. Smaug and Thorin, and she said, yeah, and then we had to think of it, and it became, it, I loved the, I will not part with a thing. The four of us from Lake Town, and we were dropped on the side of this mountain as we were actually doing the shot, which I thought was quite funny. It felt very dramatic, and it felt very epic. It was a fun day. When we went to Rock and Pillar, the weather was a lot calmer and actually it was quite hot, I remember, which wasn't the case for, for May. Because it looked so beautiful. I mean, good grief. You imagine how many people would come and visit this. It looks fun. We decided that he makes everything from local materials. and. I mean, when you want to look like a child, you can forget any sense of kingship. Cheers! I remember sitting in the rocking chair. Look at the size of it! This enormous rocking chair. I mean... Look at that. This makes me want to take up with Oh! Bayorn's... Collapses. He just can't take the side of the blood and, and, and loses it. And it. The intention, you can tell. Big by the double! Where am I? What's this? Leaf Town Medicine. Is it a crime now to be lost in the forest? To be hungry and thirsty? It is a crime to wander in my realm without leave. If you forget, you are using the road my people made. He's done hand on Dolpho. Great at over. In two days, the last moon of autumn and the first sun of winter appear in the sky together. And the bells shall ring in gladness at the Mountain King's return. But all shall fail in sadness, and the lake will shine and burn.